Hello and welcome to lecture number five. Today we will explore a wide range of topics covering many aspects of colonial society. The approximate time period to be covered will be the colonial era up to about 1750. There are a few key items to be explored in this lecture. First, we'll compare and contrast some of the traits of both the New England colonies and those along the Chesapeake Bay. Next, we'll explore some of the patterns associated with the colonial economy and local governments. The history of ideas will also be studied, which will include a discussion of the Enlightenment and the Great Awakening. Overall, by the end of this presentation, you should be able to come to a greater understanding of life during the colonial era. The first topic will be a comparison between New England society and life along the Chesapeake. The third lecture described the early history of the New England colonies, but just as a little review, this map identifies most of the colonies included in New England. The region includes today's states of Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. This self-portrait might be a good place to start when studying some concepts of New England society. Thomas Smith was a captain, and he seems to combine his own maritime life with that of his own pious Puritan faith. The image in the background depicts a battle scene with ships, but he also holds in his hand a skull which reminds viewers how brief life really is. The skull is placed on top of a poem where the writer looks forward to a future in which the Eternal would crown me, after grace, with glory. New Englanders placed a heavy emphasis on education, which began in childhood. Toward that end, by 1647 in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, every town with more than 50 households was required to appoint a teacher where children could receive instruction. Harvard College was also founded in 1636 to train young men to be ministers. This emphasis placed on education appears to have had an impact on literacy rates. About 90% of adult white men and 40% of white women were literate enough to sign their names on some sort of a document. In other colonies, the rate was 50% or lower among white men. In England, only about a third of adult men could both read and write. Community life was unique in New England as towns were organized in the same general pattern. The literal center of most communities was the meeting house. This photograph shows the old ship meeting house of Hingham, Massachusetts, built in 1681. It was designed to resemble the hull of an upside down ship. If you can notice from this picture, this meeting house, a place of worship, is very simple and unadorned. settlements also tended to be very tight-knit and close to one another. Families were often granted small plots of land near the town center to build their homes. They were also given land to farm as well, however this was not necessarily next to their homes. Overall, New England towns tended to be very densely populated with several homes within one mile of each other. This high population density created an atmosphere of watchfulness, which can be linked to the Puritan mission, which was discussed in detail in lecture number three. Their goal was to establish a city upon a hill as the eyes of the world were upon them. All would be physically close to one another to ensure there was no dissent from their mission. This would also facilitate an easy work environment so neighbors could help one another if the need arose. The atmosphere of watchfulness was important and could lead to a variety of punishments, one of which is shown in this image. Convicted criminals were often publicly punished. A man might be put in the stocks for offenses such as contempt of authority, drunken and disorderly conduct, or theft. The intent was not simply to deter him from future misbehavior, but to let his fate serve as a warning to all who saw his humiliating posture. This map may offer a visual aid to demonstrate the way in which land was divided. Notice the meeting house. 
This was located in the center of town a short walking distance from everyone's home to ensure all could easily make it to worship on a regular basis. Also, if you look at the distribution of land for growing crops, it was often handed out in scattered strips. As shown in the map, for example, John Goodnow was granted 34 acres for growing crops, but this was located over five fields, all different distances from his home. New England families were also very unique. Families were crucial to the success of their communities. Very often, they were the backbone of society. Families were organized with each individual occupying an important role. Fathers were the head of the family, whereas women were considered to be subject of their husband's authority. Abuse of one's wife, however, was not condoned. There were two primary expectations for wives and mothers. They were expected to manage the households and assisted in the economic affairs of the family. When required, they might assume some of their husbands' responsibilities and become deputy husbands. About 80% of all children born reached adulthood. Because of this, sons and daughters were expected to serve as laborers. Overall, New Englanders were quite healthy. Men had a life expectancy of about 65, and it was just a bit younger for women. Now that we've explored community and family life in New England, we can compare that to life in the Chesapeake Bay. Lecture number two provided some of the early history of colonial Virginia, with a particular focus on Jamestown, but this map provides a visual of the entire Chesapeake Bay. The region encompassed segments of both Virginia and Maryland. A tobacco plantation probably forms an appropriate image to consider some characteristics of Chesapeake society. Tobacco came to dominate the landscapes in both Virginia and Maryland when it was discovered that crops could be grown and sold for huge profits. A unique tobacco culture developed in the region. Indentured servants and slave labor became common on the plantations. In contrast to settlement patterns in New England, in the Chesapeake, plantations were usually spread out. Homes were often situated along the banks of rivers or streams. This map demonstrates the pattern of land settlement in Surrey County, Virginia. As you can see, there are several homes indicated on the map that they're all placed close to the James River or connecting rivers, so as to facilitate the export of tobacco to outside markets. So even the land allotments reflect how tobacco influenced the region. Due to the layout of the towns along the Chesapeake, they typically experienced a low population density. Often, people lived in isolated settlements which might require a two or three mile walk to see a neighbor. Population density could be about six persons per square mile. In addition to these traits, rather than New England's meeting house, the large plantation homes were frequently the center for social life as a large planter might host a barbecue, music performance, or another social event. Family life in the Chesapeake Bay can also be contrasted to life in New England. If New England families were characterized by stability, those farther south could be described as chaotic. Infant mortality rates were quite high, as a typical family might see half their children die before reaching adulthood. Overall, life expectancy in the 1600s for men was about 48 years of age, while it was 44 for women, some 20 years shorter than the rates for those in New England. This could lead to very complex households where children were raised by one and maybe even multiple step-parents. Due to the high mortality rates among children, indentured servants and slaves often served as laborers. Now that indentured servants and their use in the Chesapeake Bay have been mentioned, we'll go into more detail as to how this practice operated. We'll also explore how and why planters in the region began to shift away from using servants and toward African slaves near the end of the 17th century. The use of indentured servants as a labor force on tobacco plantations was facilitated by the headright system implemented by the Virginia Company. The company awarded a headright of 50 acres to anyone willing to pay for an individual's passage to Jamestown. Thousands of men, and many women, 
chanced that they could work as a servant in Jamestown and improve their lot in life. Between 1630 and 1700, about 110,000 English colonists migrated to the Chesapeake. Of those, as many as 90% were indentured servants. Because the labor of men was in high demand, about 80% of those who arrived were male. Due to the uneven sex ratio, it was incredibly difficult for many of those men to marry and start families. The gender gap did not begin to even out until later in the century. The death rate among servants was appalling. It's possible that up to 40% died within six years of their arrival and 70% before they reached the age of 49. You're probably asking, why would so many people take this risk? Well, they weren't necessarily aware of the survival rate of other servants, but more importantly, there were important push factors in England which influenced this migration. Do you remember this graph from a previous lecture? It shows the decline in real wages in England between 1500 and 1700. There just weren't as many opportunities for advancement for many in England, and they took their chances and traveled, often to the Chesapeake, in hopes of making it there. The method of indentured servitude was unique. In return for paying the cost of their trip overseas, as well as food, shelter, and clothing, indentured servants often worked for a term of between four to seven years. These servants faced poor conditions as they could be bought and sold to different owners and they might even find themselves used as gambling stakes by their owners. By the end of their indenture, owners were required to supply former servants with clothing and enough corn for one year. In Maryland, they might even have the opportunity to obtain land at a reduced rate. Ideally, at the end of their indenture, they would be allowed to strike it out on their own. However, if one was fortunate enough to complete their contract, they often found themselves struggling on undesirable land or working as tenant farmers on land owned by someone else. For more information concerning life for indentured servants, as well as an example of an actual indentured servant contract, you can click on the hyperlink below. In the latter half of the 17th century, tension developed between former indentured servants and large landowners, which eventually resulted in a conflict known as Bacon's Rebellion. Several factors placed pressure on the relationship. One of them was the growing gap between the rich and poor. Social mobility became difficult as former servants were unable to produce enough tobacco to turn a profit. Often, if they were able to purchase land, it was on the backcountry frontier and usually undesirable. The tremendous wealth, earned with the profits of large plantation owners, allowed for the purchase of luxury items like this gold and enamel watch, which were clearly beyond the means of a small tenant farmer. Another factor influencing the relationship between former servants and large landowners was the dramatic drop in the price of tobacco. This chart indicates the dramatic changing price of tobacco. Particularly by the 1660s, the price was at times at the break-even point, at best for tobacco farmers. Can you imagine working as an indentured servant for seven years, only to discover you'll only have to work as a laborer on someone else's land because you're unable to make ends meet on your own? One final catalyst which led to increased tension between the two groups would be increased concern over conflict with Native Americans. As additional settlers, many of whom were young, single men, moved to outlying areas of the Chesapeake, they often squatted illegally on Indian land. Native Americans, frustrated with the increasing pressure on lands supposedly reserved for them, attacked. When Virginia's governor, William Berkeley, proposed the establishment of a series of forts along the western frontier rather than a military response, frustrated settlers took matters into their own hands. They were led by a fairly recent arrival to the area named Nathaniel Bacon.
Unlike many of the men he led, Nathaniel Bacon was a member of the nobility. He was in his late twenties and eventually led a militia of about 300 colonial volunteers, many of whom were former servants. Their solution to the so-called Indian problem was a war of extermination in 1676. Against the governor's orders, they massacred a group of peaceful Indians and then marched toward Jamestown. There were repeated clashes between Bacon's forces and supporters of the governor. At one point, Virginia's capital at Jamestown was burned to the ground. By the early fall, Bacon and his supporters had control of over half the colony, and then, at the height of his triumph, Bacon contracted dysentery and died. Leaderless, the rebels dispersed and the revolution came to a halt. The success of the rebellion surprised many elites in Chesapeake society. Even before Bacon's rebellion, planters in the region had increased their reliance on African and African-American slaves. However, by the late 17th and early 18th centuries, there was a shift away from using white indentured servants, who would have to be granted their freedom once their service had been complete, and more slaves, who were enslaved for life. For more information concerning Bacon's rebellion and its importance, you may click on the hyperlink below. Some statistics will help to show this shift toward slavery in the Chesapeake. In 1619, the first documented African slaves arrived in Jamestown aboard a Dutch vessel. However, as late as 1660, there were fewer than a thousand slaves in both Maryland and Virginia. They probably constituted no more than 5% of the region's population. However, we see a dramatic increase in the number of African and African American slaves in the region in the following years. By 1700, there were approximately 20,000 slaves in the Chesapeake, constituting about 22% of the region's overall population. The Chesapeake was not the only region where slavery existed in colonial society. As noted in a previous lecture, slave labor was used extensively in South Carolina. However, slavery was not confined to the southern colonies. It existed in every single English colony in North America. For example, by the mid-1700s, slaves constituted about 20% of the population of New York City. Thus far, we've addressed some key aspects of colonial society, but we'll now move on and explore some issues involving economics and politics. While many living in the colonies might be third or fourth generation Americans, there were still very important ties which bound the colonies to the home country. One of the most important was seen with trade. England, or its colonies, purchased more goods than any other nations and also provided the overwhelming majority of colonial imports. Part of the reason for these close economic ties came from the economic theory or philosophy of mercantilism. Mercantilism was an economic theory popular among European nations at this time. It held that a nation's power was determined by its wealth, particularly in gold and silver. To accumulate this wealth, nations needed to export more goods than were imported. To achieve this goal, nations must produce everything they needed so as not to be required to import goods from other countries. The development of colonies played a key role in this system. The impact of mercantilism can be seen in the relationship between England and its New World colonies in a few ways. First, the colonies would be a source for raw materials such as tobacco, sugar, lumber, furs, and other items. Secondly, the colonies became an immediate market for the sale of manufactured products. Maybe this map can help show what some called triangular trade. Raw materials such as furs or tobacco could be shipped from the American colonies to England. From England, manufactured items and trade goods were often sent to the West African coast. Here, goods were traded for African slaves. Ships then headed west to ports in the colonies where they offloaded cargoes of slaves and manufactured items. As you can see, there were many different variations of this trade. Often, the most valuable commodities exchanged were enslaved people and the products of their labor. To ensure the success of this system, Parliament passed a series of Navigation Acts beginning in the 1650s. First, all goods entering the colonies had to be transported on English vessels. Secondly, certain valuable and enumerated American goods had to be shipped and sold in England or other English colonies. These included items such as wool, sugar, tobacco, indigo, and others. Finally, 
all goods produced in foreign nations had to be shipped through England first before making their way to the colonies. While it was difficult, if not impossible, to enforce the Navigation Acts fully, they did serve to benefit the British economy. They also benefited the economies of several port cities in the Americas. As this graphic shows, the cities of New York, Philadelphia, and Boston experienced strong population growth beginning in 1690. The King and Parliament established the ground rules, so to speak, whereby colonial trade was regulated. However, each colony did have its own local governmental units which at times executed these laws, but were also created to govern other areas as well. By the end of the 17th century and into the 18th century, the structure of colonial governments was quite similar. First, each colony had a governor. In most cases, they were appointed by either the king or the colony's proprietor. The two exceptions to this were Rhode Island and Connecticut. Secondly, each colony had a council or upper chamber in its legislature. These men were usually appointed by the governor and served as advisors to him. Finally, the colonies had representative assemblies. Members of the assemblies were elected by eligible voters in each colony, and they had the power to pass laws and establish taxes. They also controlled each colony's budget. Theoretically, the governor had the most power in this system, as he was the king's representative in the colony. However, as time went on, the assemblies began to assert more power. One reason why they were able to do so is because they controlled the governor's salaries. Governors who went against the wishes of the assemblies might find the payment of their salary delayed or even lowered. Overall, qualifications for voting in the colonies were liberal for their time, if not by today's standards, as neither women nor non-whites could vote. Some colonies established property requirements for voting, but in general, most adult white males over 40 had the power to vote. This can be compared to only about a third of all men in England who had the right of suffrage. In most cases, colonial assemblies were dominated by native-born wealthy elites, often involving only a handful of powerful families. We'll now address the final concept to be discussed in this lecture by studying some intellectual history or the history of ideas. The Enlightenment was an intellectual movement in Europe in the 1600s and 1700s. It involved a wide range of different thinkers. Their goal was to apply rational thought to the universe in which they lived. Rather than relying on religious texts or clergy to answer questions, they wanted to explore the world themselves. By applying the scientific method, they hoped to come to a greater understanding of the universe. One such enlightened thinker was the English mathematician and physicist, Sir Isaac Newton. Newton studied and discovered the laws of gravity and applied them to the solar system. He showed how a series of natural laws, in this case involving gravity, could be applied to the universe to explain the differing orbits of the sun and planets in the solar system. While Newton was a forerunner in the area of science, John Locke influenced enlightened thought in both society and politics. One concept developed by John Locke was the compact theory, which outlined the proper role of the government. First, he argued all individuals have natural rights. These include the right to life, liberty, and property. Secondly, to protect those rights, people establish a government with a limited set of powers. Finally, if the government somehow oversteps the powers, the people have the right, maybe even the duty, to revolt and overthrow a government which has exceeded its powers. John Locke wrote his major works in the 1690s, but as we will see, his ideas had a major impact on the colonies during the era of the American Revolution. At that time, many colonists argued that the king had overstepped his authority and Locke's ideas provided a philosophical justification for rebellion against the crown. In the colonies, the Enlightenment was popular among the most educated and therefore wealthiest Americans. A great example of this could be Benjamin Franklin, he was born in Boston and then moved to Philadelphia and became a very successful printer. On the right, we see an image from Poor Richard's Almanac, which included proverbs and advice like the one shown here. <laughs> 
He later concentrated his energies on promoting science and scientific discovery, and in 1743 founded the American Philosophical Society to encourage the actions of amateur scientists. Thomas Jefferson was also influenced by the Enlightenment. His writings in the Declaration of Independence were clearly influenced by Locke's ideas. Both Jefferson, Franklin, and others were impacted by another philosophy to emerge from the Enlightenment, Deism. Deists believed in a supreme being who created the universe, yet were skeptical of divine intervention thereafter. In a way, Deists saw God as a type of divine watchmaker who created a perfect world, then allowed it to operate on its own according to a rational set of laws. One additional factor which influenced Deism was support for religious toleration and freedom. Perhaps as a response to the Enlightenment and its emphasis on rational thought, a religious fervor spread across British North America. Prior to this, there had been a steady decline in church memberships. Historians have since labeled this new phenomena the Great Awakening. This was initially seen with the preachings of a New England minister named Jonathan Edwards. His most famous sermon was entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. For more information about Edwards and his famous sermon, you may click on the hyperlink below. Probably the most famous preacher affiliated with the Great Awakening was George Whitfield. Whitfield arrived from England in 1739 and preached to huge audiences. He was a tremendous speaker with a booming voice, whose travels led to increased church membership wherever he spoke. One example is shown here with Connecticut. His style of preaching was electrifying, and while some may have rejected his appeal to emotion, nevertheless, his impact was widespread. The Great Awakening had a long-term impact on the colonies. First, the number of Presbyterian and Baptist churches increased, while Anglicans in particular lost members. Secondly, we see the message of Christianity spread beyond the white community. Whitfield encouraged planters to teach their slaves about Christianity. He also argued that planters should improve their treatment of slaves. Overall, the Great Awakening left many lasting influences on American society, which were seen in the 1740s and in subsequent years. This lecture has raised many different issues associated with colonial society up to the mid-1700s. We can now review some of the most important concepts. Some important ideas discussed in this lecture include a comparison of life in the Chesapeake to that of New England. Conditions facing indentured servants and the expansion of slavery were also addressed. Economics, politics, as well as intellectual trends were also analyzed. Overall, you should be able to write an essay describing the traits of colonial society and determine which you believe to be the most important. This ends lecture number five, Colonial Society. I hope you've enjoyed today's presentation and you've learned something new. The next few slides will include links to websites for additional information concerning the issues addressed as well as a list of sources used. Have a great day.